Um, Brother Lloyd asked me if I intend to illustrate how the Millerite reform movement is repeated here at the end of the world, and, and my answer to him and for all of us is that, Lord willing, we're going to do that, but I'm going to do it one piece at a time. I'm going to put a, um, a line on this evening and add another line tomorrow night, and uh, Lord willing, by the time we get to Sabbath, we will have made a defense of the role of Islam in Bible prophecy and illustrated how illust will illustrate how the Millerite history is repeated identically here at the end, and also identify several other important prophetic truths beyond simply Islam. Uh, as Brother Rahman reminded me, we have to tell you we have materials now that it's not Sabbath out there on that table to look at and I don't know how long ago it was that we first began to understand the 2520 at least the 2520 in the end of the world setting the 2520 time prophecy of Leviticus 26 has been essentially been buried in Adventist understanding since probably the 1850 time period, and I'm not saying that the theologians at the universities didn't understand it and deal with it a little bit, but by and large, even many of the, the leaders in Adventism um, haven't understood the 2520. In fact, a brother who's here this evening, but I don't see him in the room here, um, tells a story, so I'm, and I've been telling this story after him, so he, maybe I've got a few of the details wrong which he could correct me on, but it's essentially the same. Um, if you notice back there on the 1843 chart in the upper right hand corner, you have the 2520 time prophecy of Leviticus 26 illustrated as Miller um, put it together. And I think it was maybe three years ago at the most that we started looking at this and coming to understand it. And in that process of time, the one brother who's disappeared here on this, he decided to call the Biblical Research Institute of the General Conference and ask them a question about the 2520, and he got a hold of the man at the Biblical Research Institute that's in, in the head of the historical part of, of their department. And he was on the phone with him, and he says, I want to I ask you something about the, the 2520 time prophecy. And the, the, the brother said, well, What's that? Last week. So, so the brother said, well, do you have an 1843 chart? And he says, well, yeah, there's one on the wall here next to my desk. Great works every day. And so the brother said, well, look in the upper right-hand corner. And then there was a little bit of silence on the phone, and he says, well, I hadn't noticed that before. So, I mean, this is the very highest echelon of advocacy. I mean, I may be just a little bit off on that. I, uh, and if he were here, he could correct me. But the point isn't any criticism towards him. The, the point is a verification of what we started with on Friday night, that the seven thunders were sealed up, and the seven thunders represent the Millerite history, and even some of those in Adventism that have taken upon themselves the title of the experts of Advent history, um, it can be demonstrated demonstrated that through the receptions of customs and traditions that have been handed down from generation to generation, those truths have been lost. Now, how many of you were here Friday night? That's, that's a fair amount. How many of you weren't here Friday night? Okay. Uh, the reason I'm saying that is we've already put some, some spirit of prophecy passages into, the, into this presentation that I'm not going to go back to, but I'm going to tell you what they said so you, so you have a point of reference see them in the first presentation if you want to test them out. We looked at um, Revelation chapter 5 the first evening. In Revelation chapter 5, um, John sees God the Father sitting up on a throne with a book that sealed with seven seals, and he comes to understand that no man in heaven and earth was able to open that book and look thereon. So we looked at some spirit of prophecy passages where Sister White teaches that the book that is sealed with seven seals in Revelation chapter 5 is the Bible. Okay? That's one thing that we noted. But we also looked at passages where Sister White teaches what seals up the Bible 
throughout history. There are certain points in history where the Bible has become sealed. Um, Sister White teaches that when Christ was on earth, the Bible had been sealed up to the Jewish understanding. And we know that the book of Daniel was sealed until the time of the end, 1798. And we know that the seven thunders, whatever that represents, was sealed. So when Sister White's commenting on what seals up the Bible, she, and she comments more than once, these are her words. She says, the reception of customs and traditions and human teachings and maxims that are handed down from generation to generation seals up God's word. So what seals up the Bible at any point in time when it is sealed up is the receptions of customs and traditions that have been handed down from generation to generation. And so we went through Revelation chapter 5 that first night. Those of you that were here, you may remember that in the passage when John realizes that no man on heaven and earth um, can open the Bible that's sealed up or look thereon, that John wept much. And I purposely emphasize at that point, why is it that John wept at that point? And I said, keep it in the back of your mind. Lord willing, we will get would try to provide an answer about why John wept, and it's an interesting answer. So, that, that being said, I, I want to put that in place before we, we move into a little bit of the 2520. We're, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do the 2520 tonight in its, in its complete presentation, but I want to put it on the board in order to make a point, in order to get back into the Millerite history, in order to give us a another component of the Millerite history that we should expect to see repeated at the end of the world. On the 1843 Pioneer chart, if you remember, on that chart, the Millerites misunderstood the year zero. So in that upper right-hand corner, when Miller was applying the 2520 time prophecy, he's saying that it started in 677 when Manasseh was carried into captivity in Babylon. And if you add 2,520 years to 677 BC, he suggests you come to 1843. But he was wrong about the year zero. So in reality, um, it would conclude in 1844. So if we were going to illustrate William Miller's understanding of the 2520, and, and his biblical references for this were on that chart, if you haven't looked at it closely before, he says, that in 677, that Judah, the southern kingdom, now remember, Israel was two kingdoms, that Judah, the southern kingdom, was the punishment, was delivered to Judah for breaking the covenant. And that's what the 2520 is all about. In fact, if I can put something in your mind here tonight, um, number one, when it comes to the 2520 year time prophecy, brothers and sisters, there is, from my study, and I think it's, it's close, there's only a handful, maybe five subjects in the Bible that the Bible says that all the prophets spoke about this subject. Just a few subjects in the Bible where the Bible actually uses the word all the prophets spoke on this subject. And one of the subjects that all the prophets spoke on was the 2520. And the Bible says so, and once you see it, you can you can trace it through and and understand that. In fact, a friend of mine showed me since I've been here in California a book that was written by a Catholic a couple hundred years ago, or a long time ago, you know, long before uh, the Millerite time period, where he went through the Bible, understood the 2520, and showed that all of the prophets spoke about the 2520, and they they had expressions, prophetic expressions to identify the 2520 and probably the most familiar expression that a prophet would use when he was talking about this time prophecy is that it was the scattering. Ancient Israel was to be scattered among all the nations because they broke the covenant. Okay? That, that's the pioneer understanding. So in 677, the scattering of the southern kingdom began and if you go 2500 and 20 years into the future, making the correction of the Millerites, it concludes in 1844. 
Now, William Miller also understood that there, there was a 25-20 against the Northern Kingdom, but nevertheless, he determined that this prophecy, prophecy should be applied against the Southern Kingdom. And then in 1856, James White was producing the Review and Herald magazine, and he asked Hiram Edson if he could contribute some articles to help fill the pages of the Review and Herald magazine. And Hiram Edson wrote a series of articles called The Times of the Gentiles, where he um, tried to show that William Miller was incorrect on the 2520, in the sense that he, he taught that William Miller should have um, applied the 2520 towards the Northern Kingdom. Okay? And in his article, here's how he expresses it. The Northern Kingdom, remember there's two kingdoms, the Northern Kingdom was carried into captivity in the year 723. Now, if you go 2,520 years later from 723 when the Northern Kingdom was carried into captivity, you come to the year 1798. I made a point yesterday, I believe, and I referred to a book by Gerhard Demstee, um, The Foundation of Seventh-day Adventist Message and Mission, which he wrote as a textbook for the classes in the Andrews <coughs> and teaches on Millerite history. And it's a must read for any Seventh-day Adventist that is seriously understanding that the Millerite history is repeated at the end of the world because it it's documents that history as well as any. And I believe it's on page 11, and I think we probably have some of those books available <coughs> out there, but I think on page 11. We don't have any. Okay, we're all sold out. How do you spell Damstein? It's a, it's a, a Dutch name, or... Uh, yeah. uh, Spelling, the brother here, can, you can take a look at his book later on. Can I see that book? Brother Ramon, would you bring that up to me? Can I borrow that for a moment? Maybe I can turn right to the quote out of this book that I want to um, refer to. Or, and you can get this book from us. If you want to get it, we can mail it to you without the shipping. Um, his name is D-A-M-S-T-E-E-G-T. G-T, yes. Um, I think I've been saying page 11, but I could be wrong. Let me look. No, it's not page 11. It's better be an even number. If I don't find this quote right away, I'll just tell you what he says. In, um, it, it's really worthwhile to understand this. But in here, he points out correctly um, that the foundational approach... Here, here he is. He's speaking about William Miller. Now, he's going to explain the logic that a, a Millerite used when it studied Bible prophecy. This is the foundational approach that the Millerites had when they came to prophecy. And, and Damstead says, in his analysis, in William Miller's analysis of the persecuting powers of God's people throughout the ages, he developed the concept of two abominations defined as paganism, the first abomination, symbolizing the persecuting force outside the church, and the papacy, the second abomination, representing the persecuting power within the church. So when a Millerite came to the study of prophecy, he recognized that the books of Daniel and Revelation were, were illustrated upon the structure of paganism and papalism, two abominating powers. So, and all the Millerites understood this, all right? This is, this is their mentality. They all understood, we pretty much in this room all understand the same way about the state of the dead and the Sabbath, all right? They had this understanding about Bible prophecy, that it was, that it was dealing with two persecuting powers. So when Hiram Edson is writing his article saying, no, where William Miller says the 2520 should begin when the southern kingdoms carried into captivity in 677 and ends in 1844, one of his strongest arguments, at least for, from the Millerite perspective, was if you apply the 2520 to the northern kingdom, which was carried into captivity first, 
and you begin in 723, then it ends in 1798. And by doing that, the dead center of this 2520 is the year 538, and you have illustrated 1260 years of paganism trampling down the sanctuary and the host, followed by 1260 years of papalism trampling down the sanctuary and the host, and you have these two abomination powers that were the very foundational understanding of prophecy with the Millerites. So Hiram Edson's argument is pretty strong. Yeah. But in, in Hiram Edson's articles, um, thank you for this, we'll get it back to you. Um, in his articles, their title, The Times of the Gentiles, if you turn to Luke 21, verse 25, 24, Luke 21, verse 24, he, Luke 21, verse 24, says, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Amen. So, Hiram Edson, his articles is that Jerusalem, was going to be trodden down. And when the, the treading down of Jerusalem ended, then the times of the Gentiles would be fulfilled. And that's what his articles were dealing with. And his fundamental, his foundational verse to show that the times of the Gentiles ended in 1798 is Revelation 11, verse 2. Let's go to Revelation 11, verse 2. Verse 2 says, But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city, the holy city is Jerusalem, the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And the forty-two months here is the twelve hundred and six years of papal rule. So Hiram Edson said that the end of the treading down in 1798, therefore, the times of the Gentiles concluded in 1798, and therefore William Miller should have applied the 2520 to the Northern Kingdom and not the Southern Kingdom. Um, and, I, and I understand that most of us in, in Adventism have not even attempted to identify what the times of the Gentiles in Luke 21, 24 represent. And most of us in Adventism that have any thoughts on what the times of the Gentiles represent, have received that from the Protestant world, and they say that the times of the Gentiles ended in 1967 at the Three Day War, when Jerusalem was taken back from Israel, but they're, they're looking to literal Jerusalem, and Seventh-day Adventists know that end time Bible prophecy, when it deals with Jerusalem, is talking about spiritual Jerusalem. And we reject that Catholic interpretation of Bible prophecy. So Hiram Edson was right. He was looking at spiritual Jerusalem, and the Protestant understanding of the times of the Gentiles should not be accepted in Adventism, even though it is. But most of us haven't looked any other direction. But I had. I had. So about over 10 years ago, I had already determined, determined when the times of the Gentiles concluded. So when I read Hiram Edson's articles, I really liked what he had to say, but it created a problem for me. Because I had already concluded that the times of the Gentiles ended in 1844. So I had, I had a personal dilemma. Here, I like what Edson's teaching. This is good information. But he's wrong. The times of the Gentiles ended in 1798. And I'll tell you the foundational verse that was in my mind. If you go to 1844. Yes, 1844. What did I say? 1798. Okay. Go to Daniel 8.13. Thank you. Keep, keep your eye on me. <coughs> Daniel 8.13, here's the, the foundational verse for, for, for how I was understanding it. Daniel 8.13 says, then I, and we know the answer. There's a question going to be raised in verse 13, and the, the answer is in verse 14, and the answer is under 2300 days. The answer is 1844. Okay, so verse 13 is a question, and everyone in this room already knows the answer is 1844. Verse 13 says, 
Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? Well, the sanctuary is Jerusalem, and it's saying here that Jerusalem is going to be trodden underfoot until 1844. So there was a dilemma. You know, in Pyramus it has more than Revelation 11 verse 2 to, to defend his position. And there is more to defend 1844 as the end, of, as the marking of the times of the Gentiles also. I just want you to, to see this problem here. And there's a lot of ways this problem gets solved. And basically it was solved by understanding that both of these time prophecies are valid. Both were the southern and the northern kingdom were punished um, for their disobedience to the law of God. They broke the covenant. And once it was recognized that both of these time prophecies are valid, then if you go back to verse 24 of Luke 21, something stands out that had never stood out before. In my mind, it says, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword. This is verse 24 of Luke 21 and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time in the plural of the Gentiles is fulfilled. The times of the Gentiles is in plural. And for me, that, that tells me that the times of the Gentiles is, is fulfilling in this 46-year period. It's coming to a conclusion. So... Bear that in mind, this 46-year period is the, the history that we're going to be looking at of the Millerite movement. And this was the scattering of the northern kingdom, and this was the scattering of the southern kingdom. And, and brothers and sisters, if you have a pioneer CD-ROM, and you go back to the early pioneer writings that are available on that CD-ROM, you will find that they were all conversant with the scattering. If, if, Joseph Bates talked about the scattering, or James White, or William Miller, they all understood that that was referring to the 2520 year time prophecy. But here at the end of the world, we're not familiar with that any longer because that history is the history that's represented by the seven thunders, and the seven thunders was sealed up. And that history was sealed up through the receptions of customs and traditions that have been handed down from generation <coughs> to generation. Um, let me read you something here and try to make a point. If you, and we don't, I'm certain that we don't understand. I don't know how to convey this until you begin to look at the pioneer writings. Or the pioneers. If you re reference the scattering and the, and the gathering of Bible prophecy, they knew it was the 2520. And there's a promise with the, with the scattering. There was a promise that at the end of the scattering, uh, like Isaiah says, the Lord would stretch forth his hand a second time to gather the remnant of his people. That gathering is the conclusion of the scattering. There's a promise that the Lord, at the end of scattering ancient Israel in 1844, he was going to gather modern Israel. And all the pioneers understood that. But if we don't understand that at the end of the world, and we don't, then it is very difficult to understand what Sister White is saying in the chapter called The Gathering Time in Early Writings, page 74. Now, I'm going to read you the, the very first paragraph from this chapter that's called The Gathering Time. If you understand that the scattering is identifying the 2520 time prophecy and the gathering is marking the conclusion of that prophecy when the Lord is raising up modern Israel, then you understand how Ellen White understood this. But if you don't know what it is, like we know here at the end of the world, it's, it's a big faith. So this is early writings, page 74, and, and I have a, a, what I think is an important point to make about this. So follow along. September 23rd, the Lord showed me that he had stretched out his hand the second time to recover the remnant of his people, and that efforts must be redoubled in this gathering time. In the scattering, Israel was smitten and torn, but now in the gathering time, God will 
heal and bind up his people. In the scatterings, efforts made to spread the truth had but little effect, accomplished little but were nothing. But in the gathering, when God has set his hand to gather his people, efforts to spread the truth will have their designed effect. All should be united and zealous in the work. I saw that it was wrong for any to refer to the scattering, for examples, to govern us now in the gathering. For if God should do, do no more for us now than he did then, Israel would never be gathered. Now this first paragraph to the chapter called the gathering time is not concluded. I, I've stopped before the paragraph's finished because I want to emphasize something here. If you go back, to the pioneer history, you will find that I am not misrepresenting it. When the pioneers talked about the scattering and the gathering, that meant the 2520 time prophecy to them. And every Millerite preacher taught the 2520 because the only thing they used to preach was the 1843 chart. And up in the upper right hand corner, you can see the witness that that's what they were teaching. Okay, so may be unfamiliar ground to you, but this is fact. So here in this paragraph, when Sister White is talking about the scattering and the gathering, before the paragraph's over, you know what the next sentence is? I, the sentence that I just read was, I saw that it was wrong for any to refer to this gathering, for examples, to govern us now in the gathering, for if God should do no more for us now than he did then, Israel would never have been gathered. I have seen that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and that it should not be altered. Now, brothers and sisters, you can dissect that 1843 chart and the one prophecy on that chart that is dealing with the scattering above them all is the 2520. So when Sister White's endorsing that chart, the prophecy that she's endorsing more than any other on that chart is the 2520. Amen. So, so no matter what the modern theologians are starting to conclude about the 2520, Sister White's endorsed that prophecy in the early writings, page 74, by context, if you want to study it out. So what I want you to see, if you would, and what, we're, what we are heading for, is we're going to start putting characteristics on the Millerite history that will be repeated in the history when the 144,000 are raised up. This is the history of the Millerites that we've been looking at. And we're saying that in 1798, the time of the end arrived. And there was an increase of knowledge at that point, of prophetic knowledge about the upcoming sacred history. And the sacred history of the Millerites was to announce that the judgment was going to begin. And so the increase of knowledge arrived. In 1833, the Lord raises up, formalizes the message, uses William Miller to put the message of the judgment into a package. And then in 1840, William Miller's message is confirmed. Now, as we pointed out, it was confirmed by a prophecy concerning Islam in the sixth trumpet. And the fulfillment of that prophecy confirmed that the year-day principle that the Millerites had been employing to make their predictions about the end of the world was correct. And at this point, the mighty angel of Revelation 10 comes down and he empowers the message and it, according to Great Controversy, page 611, it goes to every mission station in the world. But in verse 9 of Revelation 10, it's at this point that John goes and takes the little book and eats it, and it's sweet in its mouth. And it's sweet in his mouth because the year-day principle had been confirmed. Before this time, the Millerites are preaching what they're preaching, but everybody's saying, ah, oh, what you're saying about the end of the world, it's foolishness. And what you're saying about the soon coming collapse of the Ottoman Empire, that's foolishness. But on August 11, 1840, when the Ottoman Empire came down to, on the very day of the year that they've been predicting, the little book of Daniel that was open in his hand in Revelation 10 became sweet in their mouth, because now they had been, their predictions had been validated. 
from the world. So at this point, John eats a little book, and it's sweet. Testimonies, Volume 1, page 21, in June of 1842, the organized denominations began to close their door on the Millerites. June of 1842. It wasn't until the midnight cry in August of 1844, this is the midnight cry, that the second angel's message was empowered. Right? And the second angel's message carries, reaches its climax when the third angel's message arrives on October 22nd, 1844. So here's what I want you to see. What we're, what I'm suggesting, and what you, if you've been here Sabbath and Friday night, what you've seen is that every reform movement parallels all the other reform movements, and you've, this is easy to see. I mean, I know that some of the things that, that I attempt to share are hard to see, but this pattern is easy to see, right? You, if you watched it develop yesterday, say amen. It was easy to see. So in this, you can make the case that because all of these are repeat each other, therefore, the reform movement of the Millerites will be repeated when the reform movement of the 144,000 takes place, because the Bible teaches that upon the testimony of two or three things established, and the Bible teaches that God never changes. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Sister White says in Great Controversy, page 343, that all the reform movements parallel each other. So, so you don't even need uh, her comments on the parable of the ten virgins that you can find in Review and Herald of August 19, 1890, where she says, I'm often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five foolish. This parable has been in the right history doesn't say that. She says, has been and will be in the history of the 144,000. She doesn't say that. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter. So when she's saying that, she's just agreeing with the fact that all reform movements are the same. And that this is a confirmation of, of what she said about the seven thunders, because she says the seven thunders represents a delineation of events that transpired under the first and second angel's message. And the, the events, she's commenting, and I follow this through so you understand it if, if you haven't thought it through, or at least you can understand what I'm saying and then test it later. Sister White is commenting on Revelation 10. And in Revelation 10, you have the seven thunders. And in Revelation 10, when Jesus comes down at the beginning of Revelation 10, in the first two verses, with the little book of Daniel open in his hand, that's 1840. That's when he empowers the message with the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. But by the time you get to verse 7, where in verse 6, Christ lifts up his hand and swears by him that liveth for and ever and ever, that time shall be no longer. And then in verse 7, you have the, the sounding of the seventh angel. Well, verse 6 and 7 is identifying 1844. So from verse 1, you have 1840, to verse 7, you have 1844. So Dan Revelation 10 is emphasizing the history of 1840 to 1844. And then in verse 8 through 10, you have John told to go take the little book, go to 1840, and eat the little book of Daniel. It will be sweet in your mouth. But by the end of verse 10, the little books become bitter in John's stomach. You're back at 1844 again. You have the history of 1840 to 1844 twice identified in Revelation 10, just at that level. And then in verse 11, it says, Thou must do this all again. It's all, this, this all gets repeated. So when Sister White's explaining what the seven thunders are, which is right there in Revelation 10, and she says it represents a delineation of events that would transpire under the first and second angel's messages, by the context of Revelation 10, you know that she's talking about the events of 1840 to 1844. That's the seven thunders. But she says that it also relates to future events that will be disclosed in their order. So what I'm saying is this. This week, as we begin to 
illustrate how the Millerite history is repeated to the very letter, what we're suggesting is is that there will be a time of the end for 144,000. What is the time of the end? Well, prophetically, the time of the end is always the same thing. It's the fulfillment of a, of a prophecy that sheds light on the upcoming sacred history. Let me remind you. Daniel 7 teaches clearly that after the papacy receives its deadly wound in 1798, then the judgment takes place. So when the papacy receives the deadly wound, that's a fulfillment of prophecy, then the book of Daniel is unsealed and it sheds light upon the judgment. And that's what the Millerites were to do. They were to announce the opening of the judgment. At the end of the 70-year prophecy of Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 25, 12, Daniel recognizes from the fulfillment of that prophecy that it's time to come out of Babylon and rebuild Jerusalem. So there's a fulfillment of, the, of a prophecy that marks the time of the end for this reform movement, and that fulfillment sheds light upon this reform movement's history. It wasn't shedding light on the judgment, it was shedding light on its time to build Jerusalem. The birth of Christ was a fulfillment of prophecy, and with the birth of Christ, it's shedding light upon the upcoming sacred history, which was that the Messiah was going to confirm the covenant for one week. So that in each of these reform movements, there's a time in the end that does the very same thing. So when we're taking those reform movements to illustrate the history of the 144,000, there will be a prophecy that is fulfilled that marks the time of the end for the 144,000. And when it is fulfilled, <clears throat> it will shed light upon the upcoming history. The Millerites were announcing the opening of the judgment. We will announce the close of the judgment. The Millerites were the messengers of the first angel's message. We are the messengers of the third angel's message. And the third angel's message is a warning against receiving the mark. Our message at the end of the world is a warning that the United States is going to force the whole world to receive the mark of papal authority. That's, that's the, what our history is all about. Probation isn't about to, judgment isn't about to open, judgment is about to end. The papacy is about to take control of the world. And in Daniel 11, verse 40, correctly understood, and we do not have time to go through verse 40, but Daniel 11 verse 40 identifies the alliance that is formed between the United States and the papacy to bring down the Soviet Union in 1989, and it's the first point of conquest for the papacy at the end of the world. There are three points of conquest for the papacy at the end of the world. The first is Daniel 1140, the King of the South, the Soviet Union. The second is the Glorious Land, verse 41, the United States, the Sunday Law in the United States. And the third is verses 42 and 43, when the papacy conquers Egypt, the entire world. Every time Rome's taken the world by control, whether it's pagan Rome or papal Rome, they've had to conquer three geographical areas. When modern Rome takes control of the world, it will have to conquer the King of the South, the Glorious Land, and Egypt. And brothers and sisters, in 1989, in fulfillment of a prophecy, <coughs> the first step of the papacy's return to power was accomplished, and with the fulfillment of that prophecy, light began to shine on what was about to take place. But here's, here's the thing. It, it, once you see this, I shared this with the brother uh, before we started. Uh, and this, this little truth excites me. Maybe it's not exciting. Maybe it's just one of those points where I get excited unnecessarily. But brothers and sisters, you can show, okay? You can show that verse 40 of Daniel 11 is identifying the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989. And you can show it from all over God's Word. I understand that there isn't very many in Adventism that understand that, but in Great Controversy 492, Sister White says, 
the events connected with the close of probation and the need of preparation for the time of trouble have been clearly revealed. But multitudes have no more understanding of these important truths than if they've never been revealed. She says, the events connected with the close of probation have been clearly revealed. And the clearest illustration of the close of probation is Daniel 12, 1, when Michael stands up and human probation closes. And the events that precede Michael standing up are the last six verses of Daniel 11, which begin in Daniel 11, verse 40. So the fact that many in Adventism do not understand verse 40 is only proving what Sister White said when she says the events connected with the close of probation have been clearly revealed. But multitudes in Adventism don't know anything about them. So we do not have time to go through verse 40 here this week. But brothers and sisters, what we're suggesting can be defended from a variety of ways. And what I want you to see, this is the part that blows my mind. We'll come back. Verse 40 says, <laughs> and at the time of the end, should the king of the south push against him? The him is the king of the north. And you can define, we're not defining it here, I'm not defending it, I'm just telling you this so you'll see it. The king of the north here is the papacy, and the king of the south is atheistic France. They're pushed against the papacy at the time of the end in 1798. The king of the south in verse 40 is atheism, the power that dominates atheism. And verse 40 begins, and at the time of the end, should the atheism push against Catholicism, but the verse goes on and says that at some point in time in the future, the king of the north, Catholicism, would sweep away the king of atheism. That was 1989 with the collapse of the Soviet Union. So here's what blows my mind. In verse 40, it says, and at the time of the end, and Sister White says in Great Controversy, page 356, that the time of the end is 1798. The time of the end for the Millerites is identified in Daniel 11, verse 40, and the time of the end for the 144,000 with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989 is found in the very same verse. That's a mind. So, as this history repeats, the message, and we will, we're not doing this now, we will demonstrate this later, that the three angels' messages have the same characteristics in some senses, in some sense of the word. Miller preaches a message from 1833, then it's in power. The second angel's message arrived in 1842, and then at the midnight cry, it's in power. The third angel's message comes into history in 1844, and at some point in time it will be in power. So each of the messages go through history and they're in power. All right? So here we know that we're in the history of the third angel's message, which has been going through history since 1844, and we know that at some point in time, it will be empowered, and we know a Seventh-day Adventist, when it is empowered, the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down and joins with it, paralleling the angel of Revelation 10 coming down. So, we also will identify as we proceed, I'm not identifying this yet, that the second angel's message here in the Millerite history was fulfilled in the USA, and we will demonstrate that this way mark is paralleling the Sunday law in the USA. We know that in the history of the second angel's message in the Millerite time period, that we had the midnight cry, and at the Sunday law in the United States is when the loud cry is going to be accomplished. Now, I'm not saying, now, brothers and sisters, don't misunderstand me. I, I, I know some of the landmines in this presentation. The mighty angel of Revelation 18, when he comes down back here, I'm not going to argue with anyone that says this is the loud cry, but Sister White says that the loud cry represents an escalating of power, okay? So what I'm saying is, even though technically, when the angel joins with the third angel's message, that is the loud cry, it's not until God's church is purified by the Sunday law and the wheat and tares are separated and those that receive the seal of God are standing there alone that the Holy Spirit can be poured out without measure upon them. And this is the truest sense of the loud cry. And with the Millerites, this, the midnight cry concludes with the opening of judgment and the loud cry concludes with the end of judgment. 
and after the opening of judgment, the Millerites had to come to understand the Sabbath. And of course, when probation closes, then comes the seven last plagues. <coughs> so what am I getting to tonight? I want to put one more line upon this history. I think I have a few minutes to do it. And this, this is the easy to follow. You will uh, usually, um, this is easy to see, and we all, all, everyone that goes through this will appreciate this. What we're suggesting here is that the seven thunders is the truth that is unsealed. Seven thunders is the only thing in the book of Revelation that's sealed up. Revelation 10, verse 4. And then in Revelation 22, 10, which comes just before verse 11. And verse 11 is the verse that says, He is unjust, let him be unjust still. Verse 11 is the close of probation. So just before the close of probation, verse 10 of Revelation 22 says, The time is at hand to unseal the sayings in the prophecy of this book, the book of Revelation, that have been sealed up. So just before the close of probation, there will be an unsealing of prophetic truth that produces the same experience that was produced in the Millerite history. And when the Millerite history took place, the book of Daniel was unsealed. So I want you to see that. But what I want you to see this evening, just with a one line of thought, and I, have, I want to put just a couple more things in, I'm running out of time, but... But I also want you to remember that we've been focusing on Isaiah 58, 12 and saying that one of the work of the 144,000 is to raise up the foundations of many generations. And whether you understood it or not, yesterday you watched the foundations of many generations be raised up because we identified in these reform histories that it's in this part of the history, the first way mark, that the foundations <coughs> of Adventism were laid, that the foundations of the temple were laid, that the foundational message that John the Baptist set forth was set forth, that the foundational message of Moses, Elijah, and Noah always took place at that time, and we raised up the foundations of many generations, but the work of God's people at the end of the world is to go back to the old past. Our work, our foundational work, is to return to the foundations and understand them because they become buried. We don't know them anymore. They've been sealed up. So our foundational work is to return to the foundations of many generations. And when it comes to the foundations of Adventism, it is William Miller that is the man that is associated with putting those foundations together. So what we're saying here this evening is that this history of the Millerites from 1798 to 1844, that it is bookend, I don't know if this is the right way to say that, but it's bookended, bookended by the 22520 time prophecies. The times of the Gentiles are coming to a conclusion here and here. The scattering of God's people is coming to a conclusion here and here. The scattering in this history is being dispelled while the, the Lord is gathering modern Israel together. Amen. So one of the components of the Millerite history is that it takes place when the scattering is being removed and the Lord is gathering the remnant of his people. Follow me? Okay. So what I'm saying is the Millerite history is going to be repeated to the very letter. So there must be some kind of scattering that takes place in Adventism that has to be dispelled before the end of the world. And you know what? It's very plainly set forth. You know that there's a chapter in early writings that Sister White didn't write. You've all read it. How many of you read early writings? Then, then you've read this chapter. Sister White didn't write this chapter. It's a chapter called William Miller's Dream. And William Miller's Dream. Now, I want to tell you something. There's been a lot of analysis on William Miller's Dream. And I asked this the other day, kind of on the spur of the moment. Maybe some of you weren't here. But I'm going to ask it again. What's a lion in Bible prophecy? <laughs> Depends on the context, right? It can be, it can be Babylon, Judah, Christ, Satan. It can be a lion. There was a lion that came and killed a prophet, right? It depends on the context. As people have analyzed William Miller, 
William Miller's dream, many times they will say the jewels in the dream represent God's people. James White said so, but James White was wrong. Jewels can also represent the truths of God's word, and you can read many spiritual policy quotes about that. Up. And I'm going to submit here right from the beginning: the jewels of William Miller's dream are the the truths. Of God's word. So let's read William Miller's dream. And what I'm suggesting is that William Miller's dream identifies the scattering that comes into Adventism that will be swept away in the time period when the 144,000 are raised up. And in this dream, correctly understood, you can recognize that the emphasis is that the foundational truths of Adventism are what gets scattered and that they are to be reestablished. And therefore, this is an agreement with what we're teaching about raising up the foundations of many generations and returning to the old path. But I want to remind you of one thing before we begin this dream. In 1798, in 1798, when the book of Daniel was unsealed, Daniel 12 said it would be sealed up to the time of the end. <coughs> Sister White says this books of Daniel and Revelation complement one another. They bring each other to perfection. And the unsealing of the book of Daniel that is also identified in the book of Revelation is identified in Revelation 5 and onward when Christ, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, begins to unseal the Bible, the seven seals. That he is doing the work, he was unsealing the prophetic truths that brought about the Millerite experience, and he did not begin to do that work until John wept much. This is page 81. I dreamed, this is William Miller's dream. All right. I dreamed that God, by an unseen hand, sent me a curiously wrought casket about 10 inches long by 6 square, casket being a box. But why in the world do we have to know that it's 10 inches by 6 square? Why do we have to know that? Why don't we just say the Lord sent me a curiously wrought box? Why do we have to know that it's 10 by 6 by 6? Because, brothers and sisters, if you multiply 10 by 6 by 6, you come to 360, and you see the year-day principle, the premier rule of Bible prophecy of William Miller is being identified in this casket. Praise the Lord. 360. Made of ebony and pearls, curiously inlaid. To the casket was a key attached. And when James White comments on this, he says the key represents the rules of biblical interpretation adopted by William Miller. I agree. There's a box. Which is, what's being emphasized is the one rule that William Miller used above them all, the year day principle, and the key is identifying the rules of Bible prophecy adopted by the man that Sister White calls the messenger of the first angel, the man that the Lord used to assemble the foundations of Adventism. Now, I immediately took the key and opened the casket, when, to my wonder and surprise, I found it filled with all sorts and sizes of jewels, diamonds, precious stones, and gold and silver coin of every dimension and value, beautifully arranged in their several places in the casket, and thus arranged they reflected a life and glory equal only to the sun. Wouldn't you love to see that casket? Look at the 1843 chart. That's the casket. Amen. That's it. That's the truth that he saw assembled. The next, the next paragraph says, I thought it was not my duty to enjoy this wonderful sight alone, although my heart was overjoyed at the brilliancy, beauty, and value of its contents. I therefore placed it on a center table in my room, and I gave out word that all who had a desire might come and see the most glorious and brilliant sight ever seen by man in this light. That's, like, that's the preaching of the message. Yes. The people began to come in, at, few, at first a few in number, but increasing to a crowd. From 1833 to 1840, it was a few, but when the year-day principle was confirmed to the world, then the crowds that were coming to Miller's meetings were crowds. At, few, at first a few in number, but increasing to a crowd. When they first looked into the casket, they would wonder and shout for joy. But when the spectators increased, everyone, everyone began to trouble the jewels, taking them out of the casket and 
scattering them upon the table. I begin to think that the owner would require the casket and the jewels again at my hand, and if I suffered them to be scattered, I could never place them in the places in the casket again as before, and I felt I should never be able to meet the accountability, for it would be immense. I then began to plead with the people not to handle them, nor to take them out of the casket, but the more I pleaded, the more they scattered. And now they seem to scatter them all over the room, on the floor and on every piece of furniture in the room. I then saw that among the genuine jewels and coins, they had scattered an innumerable quantity of spurious jewels and counterfeit coins. Are there any false doctrines taught in Adventism today? I was highly incensed at their base conduct and ingratitude and reproved and reproached them for it, but the more I reproved, the more they scattered the spurious jewels and false coin among the gen genuine. There's a scattering going on here, brothers and sisters. It's paralleling the scattering here. It's different, but it's a prophetic parallel. Dead on. I then became vexed in my physical soul and began to use physical force to push them out of the room. But while I was pushing one out, three more would enter and bring in dirt and shavings and sand and all manner of rubbish until they covered every one of the true jewels, diamonds, and coins which were all excluded from sight. Brothers and sisters, there's very few Seventh-day Adventists that can give Bible studies on the truths that are represented on that chart the way the pioneers understood them because they've been buried from our sight. They've been sealed up because that is the foundation of truth that arrived in the history that's represented by the seven thunders. Amen. Which were all excluded from sight. They also tore in peace my casket and scattered it among the rubbish. I thought no man regarded my sorrow or my anger. I became wholly discouraged and disheartened and John wept much in Revelation 5. Then the line of the tribe of Judah appeared to unseal the book of Daniel to begin the Millerite history. Millers just described a scattering, a covering up, a bearing of the foundational truths of Adventism. And he reaches the point where he starts weeping just like John. Amen. When John wept in chapter 5, then the line of the tribe of Judah appears. While I was thus weeping and mourning for my great loss and accountability, I remembered God and earnestly prayed that he would send me help. Immediately the door opened and a man entered the room. When the people all left it and he, having a dirt brush in his hand, opened the windows and began to brush the dirt and rubbish from the room. I cried to him to forbear, for there were some precious jewels scattered among the rubbish. He told me, fear not. Who is it that says fear not? If you know who it is that says fear not, you know who the dirt brush man is. And Sister White says the dirt brush man is Christ. And Sister White says the line of the tribe of Judah in Revelation chapter 5 is Christ. He told me to fear not, for he would take care of them. Then while he brushed the dirt and rubbish, false jewels and counterfeit coin, all rose and went out of the window like a cloud, and the wind carried them away. In the bustle, I closed my eyes for a moment. When I opened them, the rubbish was all gone. The precious jewels, the diamonds, the gold and silver coins laid scattered in profusion all over the room. He then placed on the table a casket much larger and more beautiful. And those of you that know this question, don't answer. Those of you that know it from previous presentations, don't answer. I want everyone else to think about it. He then placed on the table a casket much larger and more beautiful than the former. Why is the casket now bigger? The time. Because in the Millerite history, where the foundational truths were assembled, they had the Bible. But at the end, we have the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. It's bigger at the end. He then placed on the table a casket much larger and more beautiful than the former and gathered up the jewels, the diamonds, the coins by the handful and cast them into the casket till not one was left, although some of the diamonds were not bigger than the point of a pin. He called upon me to come and see. I looked into the casket, but my eyes were dazzled with the sight. 
they shone with ten times their former glory. Very I thought they had been scoured in the sand by the feet of those wicked persons who had scattered and trod them into dust. They are arranged in beautiful order in the casket, every one in its place, without any visible pain of the man who cast them in. I shouted with very joy, and that shout awoke me. And brothers and sisters, Sister White says the parable of the ten virgins is going to be repeated to the very letter. And the virgins in the Millerite history, when they woke up, they gave the midnight cry. And when we wake up at the end of the world, and when the parable of the ten virgins is fulfilled again, we're going to give the loud cry. And that's what Miller's representing here. Amen. At the time that the seven thunders are unsealed and the dirt brush man comes in to reestablish the foundations of Adventism and put these truths back into order, is the time of the loud cry of the third angel. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we're recognizing these things at this time means that the seven thunders are being unsealed and their probation is about to close. That was easy to see, wasn't it? There's a scattering and gathering that took place in the Millerite history. And the Lord is now in the process of gathering the 144,000 together. Shall we go? <coughs> Heavenly Father, we... Although we don't understand it fully, we thank you for the work that was accomplished by the pioneers of Adventism, William Miller and his co-workers. And we ask that you give us the discernment to recognize those foundational truths and help us to put them in the proper place that they can establish support and glorify this final message. And we thank you for doing the work of unsealing these things and now ask that you would use your spirit to convict us of our personal unreadiness identifying to each one of us the areas in our lives that need to be surrendered that we can become the tools in your hands that you use to finish this work. We realize that there's 14 or 15 million Seventh-day Adventists in the world today and that it's such a small percentage that are hearing these things that it's just overwhelming, but we know that you've always identified that when you do a work, you will take a small army and bring the victory to pass. So we ask that what you're accomplishing with us here this evening would be the start of, of this final warning message in this part of the vineyard, and that we could finish this work soon and get out of this horrible world. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.